go. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Thursday evening financial thing live stream. Um, it's been an interesting week. I hope everybody is having a good week. Thank you for spending your time here with me, listening to me natter. Um, what are we going to talk about today? A lot of stuff going on in the financial markets. Uh, as you've seen a pretty big uptick in the stock market recently over the last few days. Oil making a rebound, then coming back down. We talk about some peer-to-peer -peer news, obviously the last of the big three. I mean, not technically the last because we still got funding circle, but Zopa deciding that they will be winding down their peer-to-peer -peer lending operations. Uh, something that I've kind of been talking about for, I would say, several months that I figured that would be what would happen with Zopa. Um, and then I think uh, <clears throat> next, to be, next to go will be Funding Circle. That will be the end of the big three. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, please hit that thumbs up if you can. Helps with the YouTube algorithm and that way I don't have to nag you through the stream. And we're going to desperately try to get this under an hour tonight we'll be doing one more stream i think before the end of the year next thursday and then i will be hopping on a plane through montreal canada back to london in december to come enjoy some of that nice british sunshine over christmas it's beginning to look a lot like christmas um yeah 2021 has been a weird year i mean just so many things going on with, with Mr. COVID, oh, am I even allowed to say that? Uh, kind of creating havoc still and hoping that maybe 2022 will be different. But uh, unfortunately, I think we're just going to continue to see more and more strains of this situation coming out and something we're just going to have to live with. So unfortunate, but uh, that's it. You know, the, the, it is what it is. But um, thank you again for joining and quick hello to everybody. And don't forget, we did start a financial thing discord. So if you want to get in on the discord and do some live chatting with your fellow uh, financial thing community members, I do monitor what is going on on there. But there is a link in the description below. It's free to join, of course. And if you want to become a Patreon supporter, you could just snap that little QR code with your phone. It'll take you right to Patreon. And for as little as one cup of coffee a month, I guess it depends where you go to, but uh, certainly one Starbucks with that cream that they put on there, uh, you could support my work. Totally up to you, of course. I never beg, but anything is helpful. So uh, let's get into it. Hi, Alan. Alabin, Annabelle Nyron is here, of course, in Spain, calling in the Peak District. Mike in Miserable Sutton. Peter Vincent, Leatherhead, Drizzling. John Day in Nottingham. Xmas, Deckies, Unpacked. Deckies, <laughs> haven't heard that one in a while. Deckies, Paul Bagworth in Kenilworth. Sorry, it's damp and dark over there. Paul in a very wet stock. Paul, all this, all this rain, I mean... It's not making me want to uh, hop on the plane back there. Sue Lund is here. Usually at pub quiz Thursdays, but there's too much CVID going around. So you're going abroad soon. Hopefully you're going somewhere nice, Sue. Somewhere nice and warm. David Dawson is here. Patrick Tate. Nice to see you. Brian in Woborn. Lionfish hunting from the Cayman Islands. Hello, Debbie's husband. Nice place to be. And uh, David Halls is here. Let's see what's going on in the news today. Kind of go through everything. Put your comments in there and we'll do a Q&A at the end if there's anything that you want to, uh, want to discuss or look at. <clears throat> Let's see, we have, oh, LendInvest. Look at this, LendInvest shares soar after Buoyant interim. So I've said this before on the stream. Obviously, Lend Invest, not technically a peer to peer company, but it's something that is on the watch list in the top five 
Uh, they've had a really good profit uh, reporting. Pl platform revenue was up by 28% to 72.4 million. Gross profits increased by 51% to 26.5 million. This reflects the higher fees being charged by the platform, as well as interest income generated as a result of the increase in the uh, AUM. So obviously this is an AIM, alternative investment market listing. This is a, uh, a type of share for smaller companies like Lendivis, so they can float on the stock exchange. Not, not like the big boys, but uh, usually considered higher risk. Um, not something that I dabble in share wise. I, I, you know, just a little bit too risky on the share wise for me to be investing in. But again, very, very solid numbers from Lend Invest as they continue to uh, really grow their business. And um, I, I, I can, I, you know, I think they will still continue to do well next year. Hopefully the economy will sort of settle down and become more positive but even in this bad times they have done really well so their share price has gone up to 204p from 195p so small small increases but good results from them so the big news an update peer-to-peer -peer. zopa is set to close its peer-to-peer -peer lending operations i said it several months ago i thought that both funding circle and zopa would be exiting out of retail peer-to-peer -peer lending um so re i really wasn't surprised to hear this good thing is let's look at the update here that they sent out they plan to return everybody's money which is uh excellent it says by january 22nd sorry january 31st 2022 our investors will receive the full value of their invested balance is back in their SOPA holding accounts. This means that no investor will miss out on any of the interest they've built out. There will be no impact to the borrowers. SOPA will, um, will be buying up the loan book. And uh, really, this is kind of an obvious move for SOPA because they can just focus on their bank. And as we all know, the big banks, very, very profitable. Uh, it's not often that you see banks go out of business. We see it a lot more in peer-to-peer -peer lending companies than banks because banks have got their hands into all kinds of uh, different things. And um, it, it's kind of a sad day really for peer-to-peer -peer lending because these guys, Zopa, have been going since 2008. They were the original grandfather of peer-to-peer -peer lending and they were able to survive the uh, 2009 financial crisis and uh, really grow as a business. So unfortunate, but... You know, there was a lot of people out there that would say Zopa wasn't the best place to invest money. Some people were happy, others were not. I always thought that the risk versus reward was too high on the risk for what you were getting paid back in interest, which is why I never really put too much money into Zopa. I had a little small bite, small nibble in there. <clears throat> but they say since launching our platform, the average return has been 5% even during the coronavirus pandemic and su subsequent lockdowns, we are still able to deliver an average return of 3.9%. So this is what they cite reason for closing here. However, over the fa last few years, customer trust in peer-to-peer -peer investing has been damaged by a small number of businesses whose approach led to material losses for retail investors. They're talking about you, collateral, money thing, you know, uh, <clears throat> Wellesley and Co., Landy, Funding Secure, the list goes on. So uh, I think this has made it challenging for Zopa to continue to grow. Peer to peer lending has taken a hit, um, you know, it has, and Zopa is one of the big three has, re has felt that. Well, maybe this is just an excuse for them to uh, exit out of the space gracefully. And that would be a pretty good excuse to do it. Now, they also said a link to this. The change in regulation which followed raised the operational costs of running a peer-to-peer -peer business, obviously having to do regulatory reporting. All the costs that come along with that certainly increase their cost flow basis. And as well as the cost of uh, attracting new investors to the platform. To offset these increased costs and ensure we have a sustainable and profitable business, 
we'd need to reduce investor returns to a point that no longer be attractive and commensurate with the risk that investors take on. And, you know, even at, even at uh, 5%, there would be a lot of people that would argue, is the risk really worth the 5%? Some of those returns are starting to look a little... Uh, a little low for the risk that you do take with Zopa because you were uh, lending to obviously um, higher risk, in some cases businesses, also unsecured credit lines to consumers, which is technically a higher risk play. And to only get 5%, you know, or through COVID 3.9%, well, it really wasn't looking like a good, good play for investors. So I think Zopa could see the writing on the wall and they just decided let's focus on where we really are going to make money and that's through their bank. So funding circle to review peer-to-peer -peer retail business in June. Obviously they have not allowed people to, to lend, retail investors to lend. It's been on hold. They are going to review this. Uh, we just need to see how things progress over the coming months. This is what Mr. Desai said, and we need to see the economy distress and then we'll evaluate when's the best time to revisit our retail offering. Now, I'll make a prediction here, right or wrong. I personally think that Funding Circle uh, will not offer retail peer-to-peer -peer lending again. I think they will be the last of the big three to exit the space, um, probably running towards institutional investing and then i guess it really dep depends on the government uh, recovery loan scheme see how that long that runs but i really think that uh, funding circle will pivot into something different i just don't see that uh, knowing both rate sets uh, zopa maybe the funding circle could see the writing on the wall and this is just a chance for them to plan over the next six months to exit the space and there's a lot of, again, negative sentiment out there for investors who have invested in Funding Circle in the past. They, they don't have you know, good sentiment out there, and I think maybe they can understand that. And honestly, dealing with retail peer-to-peer -peer lenders can be a pain in the butt. You got, rather than dealing with an institutional lender, maybe you have a few of those versus thousands of uh, retail peer-to-peer -peer lending. I mean, I don't think people realize how much of a challenge it is to deal with that many individuals, you know, especially people within the peer-to-peer -peer lending sector can be a little finicky and probably calling them a lot, complaining, and maybe Funding Silver just thinks, well, there's other ways that we can make money with this business, with the loan book, maybe cutting the retail side out is probably the way to go. So I'm going to uh, bookmark this video. December the 9th, 2021, I'm going to go on the record and say I don't think that Funding Circle will return to retail peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending. But let me know what you think about that. Up next, we have uh, crop, Crowd Property has paid back £100 million to investors. So that is a quite a big milestone for them uh, on their blog. They've had a total of eight billion pounds of applications uh, for financing, but they have lent 360 million. So out of eight billion pounds of applications, only 360 million meant that. Meant, that means what is that? Uh, five, it's a little bit less than 5%, so about 4.5% of applications actually being approved. So that goes to show you, firstly, how Crowd Property really screens their loan applications, which I think is generally a good thing um, also loan to value here of 60.1 percent and loan to gross development value 55.4 percent and 59.7 percent including interest crowd property has now funded the development of 360 million pounds of property projects the construction of 1800 homes agreed 215 million pounds of facilities and lent 170 million pounds so a hundred percent payback record and an average rate of return of 8.3 percent a year so very very positive numbers for crowd property and mike bristow over there uh, i think one of the shining 
stars in oh hold on one second well, yeah one of the shining stars of pit to appear at the moment definitely so crap probably good news coming from them that's that's a big milestone i mean imagine paying back 100 million pounds to investors that's definitely a big one uh eight this is a funny news story i thought hmrc proposes isa breach penalties so isa manage, managers could face new penalties if they break break isa rules uh, the fca is probably a part of this but uh, this was the funny thing hr hmrc's proposals which would apply to all types of ices include a 10 pounds fine per, per compliance breach 10 pounds that would certainly put me off from making a, a compliance breach that is per account multiplied by the number of relevant tax years so 10 pounds certainly a stinging fine that is one of the proposals another proposal option was to induce a one percent penalty of the value of the investments affected at the end of each tax year this measure would apply to minor breaches like not completing isa transfers within the permitted time limits or failing to correctly manage isa subscriptions so somebody had a uh, ten thousand pound investment that was not managed correctly they would pay a hundred pound penalty so not exactly stinging penalties i'm sure if this uh, hmrc proposal was a thousand pounds fine per compliance breach that would probably be strictly adhered to but 10 pounds not really sure for more significant breaches hr mrc is mulling the introduction of a flat fee of 100 pounds per account per tax year and isa managers could face a five percent penalty on the value of investments affected at the end of each tax year you know some of these isa rules can be a little bit confusing too for people especially within the ifisa rules about only being able to open one new account for the current tax year and then moving things around i don't really know how they even uh, track all this stuff but uh, hmrc is trying to put the kibosh on those mistakes cufflink malls a uh, sip launch and an ipo i'm gonna actually be trying to meet up with mr Narinda and harry when i'm over there to find out about this, this is quite an interesting story i think it was maybe a little bit more clickbaity with the ipo thing but they are considering a sip launch cufflink is such a launch a set product in the third quarter of 2022 as they eye future growth and uh, in the longer term the platform is open to considering an IPO which would be uh, offering shares on the uh, stock exchange well this is unlikely to take place until 2024 at the earliest I think that is quite a grand a grand goal for cufflink you know i mean they're not a huge company but certainly not the size of lend invest but for them to consider an ipo at this stage stage is uh was an interesting i was interested to to read about that i think that's part of their business model that they're looking to scale up um you know one thing i would say about scaling is it's obvious to me that some of the uh, big companies have found it very difficult to scale and maybe that's their model of uh, unsecured lending through rates said it was difficult to scale as you know most of their lending was unsecured and obviously we've seen zopa maybe they've found it very difficult to scale so you wonder when these companies really want to get very much bigger how does that work financially for them oh and by the way cufflink is a sponsor of this youtube channel and show today so you can get up to four grand of cash back on your first investment as a new a new investor this is not applicable to current investors terms and conditions do apply remember your capital is not protected by ffcs and your capital is at risk you can go to join.cufflink.com front slash financial dash thing if you have not signed up at cufflink i recommend checking them out so thank you again to cufflink for their generous sponsorship um so yeah uh they are going to consider that it's still early days the public listing is something we'd consider but now not now as our plan is to keep the profitability in the group and reach our targets which we we're ahead of and look at the ipo in 2024 so it'll be interesting to see how they continue on forward 
third of professional crypto, a uh, third of professional investors have recently invested in cryptocurrency. Now, when we say professional investors, I'm presuming they mean institutional investors because they don't really specify what that means. But this story says professional investors are increasingly focusing on crypto and digital assets with one third recently investing in crypto assets for the first time. Uh, just over half of the investors questioned in the UK, US, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia and Brazil believe the strong performance of the crypto asset class during the pandemic has altered institutional views of the sector and just over half strongly agree that digital assets are a viable asset class. 45% slightly agree with this view. So uh, interesting, right? It's a very interesting statement. Just over half strongly agree that digital assets are a viable asset class. So that means that a uh, little bit less than half don't agree that digital assets are a viable asset class, yet they're investing, which leads me to wonder if these people actually know what they're really investing in, which I think is one of the problems with cryptocurrencies right now. A lot of people don't really understand uh, what they're investing in. I think this poll shows that. But why are they doing this? That's the question. They're investing in cryptocurrencies because, honestly, the ones that don't view it as a, a viable asset class are looking for returns. They're looking for yield. They're chasing those gains without probably understanding quite what they're getting into. Uh, you can see here around 91% of these people polled are worried about stretched equity valuations while nine out of 10 are worried about fixed income yields. So that would show you that uh, those people are worried that stock market valuations are too high, so they're nervous to go into those. While nine and 10 are worried about fixed income yields, it means that bonds are not really paying anything. So that's not really a viable asset class for them. And then here we have 22% have predicted a huge rise in the number of investment grade bonds paying negative yields in the year ahead. So your know, what question being, why would anybody actually want to invest in a uh, investment grade bond that actually pays negative interest rates? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever because investment grade bonds could mean things like corporate bonds, which basically you're lending money to corporate companies. They could be very big companies, but those companies are always at risk. There is uh, no company out there that has a 0% risk of actually collapsing. So uh, investment grade bonds are not necessarily a good investment. So if they're paying negative interest rates, nobody in their right mind would invest in things like that. Except for some of those hedge funds out there that do put people's money into investment grade bonds that are paying absolutely nothing. Uh... Yeah, so that was an interesting story I, I found. You'll see this shift now with cryptocurrencies of institutions getting involved. We had a huge gaming company called Ubisoft this week announced that they would be moving into NFTs. Uh, this is a, a very, very big company. It's an 18,000 employee company based in France and in Canada. And um, yeah, this is, you know, this is what I've been saying for a little while about how I think the crypto gaming space is going to be absolutely huge. When you get a company like this, this might be the first mainstream company uh, venturing into the crypto space and the blockchain, the NFT space, and they're gonna be the pioneers. And once that happens, you're going to see this domino effect of other companies moving into the space. So more institutions, more bigger companies entering the crypto space. Uh, we are seeing some difficulties in the price fluctuations at the moment of what's going on with uh, Bitcoin. But a uh, very interesting turn of events, I think, with uh, Ubisoft coming into the space. What else we got today? I thought this was good. There was a article in the peer-to-peer -peer finance news that says, what does the future hold for peer-to-peer -peer lending? And I actually received an email this week that said, uh, hi, Lawrence, thank you for your weekly chats about investing. You're very welcome. Enjoy them all. I know you're not as Oprah investor, but I wondered if you heard about their changes. Yes, of course. 
today I had an email announcement, blah, blah, blah. Um, would be interested to know how you view the future of peer-to-peer -peer lending, perhaps in the discussion with your guest from that world. I used to have 10 different peer-to-peer -peer lending companies, but now they are narrowing down to a very, very few. So I think, um, well, my guess is for 2022 is we're going to see very, very much of the same kind of a stagnant growth in new peer-to-peer -peer lending, lending companies coming into the space. And I think there was a news story too that I saw, uh, let me see if I can find it. There was a news story saying how difficult it is for new companies to get into, uh, to get through the FCA regulation. So let me see if I can find that. Mm -mm. Where is it? I know I saw this new story, but I think that goes in with what we're saying about, you know, this was a, this stagnation of new companies coming into the space with the collapses of some of these peer to peer lending companies, uh, you know, kind of putting a negative stigma on the uh, sector in general happening then 2022, I don't foresee really any new companies coming into the space. Uh, so you're really going to be sticking with those solid companies that have been doing well through COVID and through this economic downturn. You can see the news story here. 70% of firms say FCA authorization process takes too long. Uh, the findings come from a survey of 3,883 regulated firms, which showed light on, on their views of the effectiveness of the financial regulator. 68% of them did not think the amount of time taken by the FCA to authorize a firm was reasonable. And more than double the amount of respondents who felt it was unreasonable. So what this is going to do is if a new company is thinking about coming into the space, they're going to look at uh, how long it takes to get the FCA authorization through, and how expensive it is, and that may be off-putting um, for new peer-to-peer -peer lending companies. So what I feel ha is going to happen in 2022 is very much the same as we're seeing, you know, towards the end of last six months of 2021, which is the same old companies that we talk about who seem to be doing things the right way. You know, people on the top five peer-to-peer -peer lending list, the uh, loan pads, um, the unbolters, the crowd properties, the blend networks, the same companies we talk about every week. It doesn't really change very much. Assets Capital, they seem to be uh, issuing new loans. I saw a new email come through this morning about new loans that were coming through on that platform. And um, I don't know that you're really going to see a, a plethora of new companies that you can invest in next year. And even if a new company does come out, you know how many people are really going to want to take the risk of investing through a new company when they can invest through the old ones. And if I look at my returns for 2000, I mean, the tax year, April, 2020 to April, 2021, uh, the lending interest, and I'm sure everybody out there has experienced the same thing. Your pit to pit lending interest is probably halved if you had a wide diversification of loans and companies you're invested through. I have a generally a tend to over diversify partly because of the website and me testing out these platforms. But I found that my uh, peer to peer lending rates of returns were 50% cut in 2020 to 21 through the tax year. And um, I think it would be a very tough time for new players to come into the industry, into the sector. So I think you're just going to see this continued straight line. You might get one or two companies come out in 2022, but I certainly haven't seen anything that's really piqued my interest that I would want to move necessarily out of the companies that I'm in right now to chase returns. Uh, I think there's better ways to diversify. Not to say there's you know not some good companies out there, but people generally have a amount of capital that's fixed that they're willing to invest into, you know, something like peer-to-peer -peer lending or crypto or stocks and shares, whatever that may be. And uh, since we only have a limited amount of money that we can 
put into a sector or into peer to peer lending companies, it's hard to justify moving out of a company that, say, has been performing well for two or three years into a brand new company that's coming out and really has no track record and no history. This is a tough sell. So I think you might see this stagnant um, stagnation of the sector for now. Not to say that the companies who are operating now won't grow. I think that they will. Uh, just new players in the market will probably be pretty small. So that was the question of the week. Uh, I have used I've used ten different pit to pits and now they're narrowing down to a very few. Yeah, I would say most people are probably going to be in you know, maybe five at the most now at this point. Uh, maybe five or six, but whereas before we had just multiple different choices where maybe there was 10, 15, 20 different options that seem to be a uh, reasonable. So interesting article here saying the industry has demonstrated through two recessions that these investments that appear to be lending a high quality and provide a complementary alternative to the stock market. That's from Neil Faulkner of Fourth Wave. Uh, crowd property launched in Australia just does is working on rolling out across Europe and the US and estate guru which is euro platform has revealed its uh, plans to expand into the UK this is Oprah's playing an IPO at some stage uh, and Stuart Law here this is interesting we absolutely believe that retail lenders have a future so assets capital will continue their retail peer-to-peer -peer lending company but they have been some uh, challenges, I think peer-to-peer, -peer, Stuart Law says, has been in the crosshairs of the FCA. It is considered to be a high-risk investment, has been labeled as that. So inexperienced investors would be staying away from it based on just that recommendation. Uh, let's see, Stuart also says putting peer-to-peer -peer in the same bracket as crypto and land banking is really disrespectful. And there are really some professional organizations with career professionals working in lending and credit. And to be put in that box with scams and crazy high risk things is very disrespectful. Um, yeah, I mean, it's tough when a few bad apples, right, have ruined the barrel of apples, <laughs> uh, as we've seen happen. So I can see why Stuart would say something like that. I don't necessarily agree about the crypto space. I think there's some very solid cryptocurrency uh, projects out there with, with very, very professional people running them. There's a lot of scams, of course, a lot of crazy stuff out there, but it's like anything. You can't bunch everything in together just because there is a few few thousand crypto scams doesn't make them all scams. It's because there's a few bad peer-to-peer -peer lending company out there and people running them were bad doesn't mean they're all bad. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens with the future next year. I don't know. Let's take a look at the uh, Trading 212 portfolio. We had a rough week, which has bounced back quite well, thanks to a pop in the oil. You can see down here, we went all the way down to 13,530 uh, pounds, which is a big drop off. You can see right up here, we're at 16.9. So, Kind of a stomach churning turn of events downwards and then we saw this pop in oil uh, oil was really heading way down south and then uh, right now we are at a account value of 15,463 so quite a big quite a big swing here almost two grand uh one a week yeah, you can see down here a little bit less than two grand but from here in the month was that November the 18th was our low point that was the lowest the portfolio has been in a while and then we saw this uh, pop in oil right here this was the oil dip and back up so how the stocks doing well I'm starting to think honestly this Alibaba decision was a bad one um, why because we had a couple of pieces of news Evergrande defaulted on its debt and that is not good news for China and its real estate situation over there. I don't think that the uh, Chinese Republic Bank will be bailing them out. They have $300 billion in total liabilities. And I think this will be the first of several Chinese 
real estate developers that will default. And then we also had, uh, where is the story? DD, which is like the Chinese Uber, which is plans to delist from the New York Stock Exchange only months after going public. So what does that mean? Well, for most people don't understand how exactly Chinese listed stocks work. But in the US, if you invest in a Chinese company, you're actually investing in a VIE, right? It's not like a US company or a European company. You can see here in this Barron's article, it says, in the case of a US listed Chinese stock, investors own shares in an offshore holding company. These shell companies are called variable interest entities or VIEs and are a corporate structure used by Chinese companies to circumvent Beijing's rules about foreign investment while still tapping US capital. The offshore company has a contractual relationship with the operating company, which means investors don't have a direct stake. It's very different to uh, like a U.S. listed foreign company of an American depository receipt. So it says investors in U.S. listed foreign companies own shares of an American depository receipt or an ADR. That's where U.S. banks bundle shares of foreign listed companies into ADRs, which are issued as a stock that being traded on U.S. exchanges for U.S. dollars. Foreign companies in turn gain access to U.S. capital. So Chinese companies are very different. So what does that mean for a company like Alibaba? Do I think that they'll delist from the U.S. exchange? Probably not. It's too big. But there is always that risk. DD was a, uh, was not a small company. And now if you were an investor in DD and you'd bought these shares on the U.S. exchanges, um, what that means is they get delisted. Well, now you cannot sell them unless they buy back those shares, which I don't think happens. Uh, you'd have to uh, sell them on the Hong Kong exchanges, which would be very difficult. So it says right here, what happens to your shares when a company delists? This is a, you know, a Chinese. If a U.S. listed Chinese company like DD delists, there are essentially three outcomes for investors, a share buyback, share transfer, or share limbo. None of those are particularly good results for investors. If it's a share buyback, uh, they can decide how much they buy those shares back for. Likely, they're not going to pay whatever the shares are trading for on the market. So uh, usually that means the share buyback would be for less money than the shares are actually being listed on the exchange for at the time. And that has to be agreed by shareholders. So a lot of problems going on with that because I don't think the company is going to buy back all its shares. It's probably in debt. Um, but yeah, big issues there. So what probably what's going to happen is the shares are going to get transferred to the Chinese exchanges and investors are going to have a real problem, um, you know, trading those shares. So this could really have a knock on effect to other Chinese companies. I don't know whether other Chinese companies will delist or not, but it's certainly a, uh, a risk for Alibaba shares. So I'm wondering, you know, was this actually a good idea? It seemed like a good idea at the time because of the price of Alibaba. This huge decline up here from 309 US dollars all the way down to, uh, I think we paid 142. So, I mean, it's still a solid company. Um, just because it's Chinese doesn't make it bad. It's still a solid company with great revenues. Massive behemoth business. But, uh, I don't know. I guess time will we'll see what happens with that so you can see some of these uh energy shares right here centris has bounced back we took a lot of profits on centris energy when it had that big big bump here over the last month and we can see the decline from 85 down to 56 we took most of our profits out of there but we did buy in at 20 pounds which is about 28 us dollars and we sold at 54 uh, not really at its high, but now we're still holding a little bit that's up about 100%. Clean Spark, the uh, crypto crypto mining companies have not performed well because of the crypto uncertainty that's happening at the moment. 
Now we're still seeing Comstock resources 18% in the red. Anything else really significant? Hut 8 has taken a big fall. Uh, let's see where we were with that. 15 down to 8. So certainly some of these companies are on pretty good discounts right now if you have the stomach for risk. Now the thing about the crypto mining sh shares is that if you are a believer in cryptocurrency, you think that Bitcoin will rebound. These uh, mining companies' share prices will definitely benefit from when these crypto prices start to run upwards, which I thoroughly believe that they will. So if you have the stomach for the risk, I think uh, not financial advice, of course, but HUD 8 at 894 is looking like a pretty good bargain right now. And even Clean Spark, 13 bucks. I mean, we were up at 22 about a month ago. It's looking pretty cheap. Laredo Petroleum has made a bit of a bounce back in the last week. You see we're down here at 54. Now all the way back to 72 and down to 68. What a, what a jump if you, again, had the foresight to come in here. Problems of market timing once again, but oil really rebounding. This was the low point down here. It did look cheap. You know, the problem is, though, the emotions. Are saying, I looked at the radio at 54 and I was thinking, wow, that's, it, just, it seems cheap. It seems cheap. Um, I mean, look here at the, the chart from June where we're up in the high 80s. And then also October in the, in the 90s. $54 for a stock that has been that high seems like it's a big discount, but the emotions are going, well, what if? This is the two problems about investing. The two problem words, what if? What if this goes down to 30? What if it goes to 20? We have no way of, of knowing that. And that's, that's one of the problems about trying to stock pick. Uh, but let's see. So anything else? Lloyd's has taken a bit of a drop off. Uh, we're 84%, but they, there was almost a point where it was 100% up on that. Facebook clawing back a little bit. We've been watching that uh, kind of peter around, drop off from 349 down to 303. We bought in at 349. So still in the red on that little bit. I think actually... Mm. Yeah, that was the average price, 349. So we're a little bit off on that one, 2.9% in the red. And then the other energy shares, we got Tullo still in the toilet and Palantir, which I don't plan on selling anytime. I think this is a really solid company. I think it will totally bounce back. Actually, again, looking pretty cheap at these prices. We look back three months ago, $28 this stock was, now down to 19 And then Vermilion Energy still doing well. It's popped back up again from its, uh, almost to its high point. See this drop off from one, uh, $11.90 all the way down to 9 and now we've popped back up to 11 So pretty volatile swings on these energy stocks, but the portfolio is still kind of doing well and this will really just be a buy and hold situation new story came out if you're a person that likes to get in precious metals you think gold and silver are good investments pay attention jp morgan to pay 50 million 60 million dollars to settle precious metal spoofing lawsuit so this means that jp morgan again has been slapped on the wrist for a manipulation of uh, precious metals markets there has been a class action litigation by investors who have accused the largest U.S. bank of intentionally manipulating prices of precious metal futures and options. And this is not the first time they have been uh, gotten themselves in trouble. In September 2020, J.P. Morgan <laughs> entered a deferred prosecution agreement and agreed to pay $920 million, including a $436 million criminal file fine to settle the U.S. government probes into spoofing and precious metals and treasuries. So if you think that the uh, the playing field's a level for us investors, this is just real news out here, which shows the manipulation of the precious metal markets by these big banks. Again, the reason why I invest in cryptocurrency is to remove myself from such institutions like JP Morgan. 
although I actually do own some JP Morgan shares because I think as a share investment's not a, a bad play, but it kind of makes me cringe to invest in these companies knowing what they're doing to, to normal investors, but don't ever think you're on a level playing field when it comes to the banks because you are not. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, for anybody that, let's take a look at the cryptocurrency market. It has been a real struggle. We thought we were going high with Bitcoin. Gave us a little nibble over the last seven days. We thought, ah, we were going to hit it, right? December 3rd. We're up here at 57,000. Then we saw this big poop into the toilet. Down here to 42. If I can get my mouse down there. And then we just kind of been seeing this sideways yuck. And now we've had another tip. We we finally broke the 51.7, 51,100, and uh, down to 47 today. So why is this happening? There's a lot of leverage traders out there who are gambling on margin at the moment. Here's an interesting story. Bitcoin Wells moved fresh coins to exchanges in a repeat behavior of before the $42,000 price dip. This means that, um, you know, whales, we consider whales, people have a ton of money in Bitcoin. They have moved their Bitcoins from cold storage wallets onto the exchanges, which usually indicates that they will be planning on selling, and that the price may take a poopsie into the toilet again. So I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, prices go back into the low 40s, maybe $41,000, $42,000. If these whales do dump this Bitcoin and then rebuy back in in the 40s, and you'll see it pop up again. Uh, but generally, uh, you know, I have to say I was wrong. I was wrong. I called a $70,000 price by the end of the year, and it looks like we still do have some time. It's about three weeks. We could have a big run up at the towards Christmas, but it's looking increasingly like Bitcoin will be hovering between forty-two dollars and $50,000, which I think you know, low 40s is a great buying opportunity for those who are not trying to trade. Uh, those people have a long-term view like I do five to 10 years in this or longer. Uh, 40s would be a good buying in price price but uh, we've seen some of this market cap here. It's close to 2.6 trillion. Get drilled down to 2.2 trillion. There's a couple of coins that have done well through this downturn. Bitcoin has not been one of them at 16%. But Ethereum has hold, held up quite well. You we saw it bump up to $4,113. Uh, down 8%. So it's only taken half a hit of what Bitcoin has. Uh, but one coin has done actually pretty good while all the other coins have struggled luna uh, has maintained is up five percent for the week whereas you can see some other coins like avalanche i think this is a good price right here 84 dollars for avalanche long-term buy i mean down down 25 percent over the last seven days so there are some really good buying opportunities but for anybody that's concerned about cryptocurrency saying is this going to be something that is around for a while look at some of these things that happened in november i mean hundreds of millions of dollars if not billions are being poured into this space this is not money that's just getting thrown up into the air for no reason one of the big pieces of news crypto.com signs a 20-year 700 million dollar deal to rename the staples center or anybody that's a basketball fan an nba fan the la lakers play there and the LA Clippers is, it's been called the Staples Center for I don't know how long a long long time but crypto.com is now uh, taken over those advertising rights for 20 years and they paid 700 million dollars for that but all of these pieces of news paradigm has raised 2.5 billion dollars for a venture fund that's a crypto development Pantera raises 600 million dollars for a venture fund uh, Commonwealth Bank leads $400 million fundraise in Gemini at $7 billion valuation. Gemini is a cryptocurrency trading platform. So Commonwealth Bank, I mean, $400 million pumping into Gemini to increase that business. 
blockchain gaming company Forte raises $725 million in funding. And the list really just goes on and on. Look at this Pokemon Go developer Ni Niantic raises $300 million to build a metaverse. This stuff is not going away. This stuff is not going away. And you've got people like Pokemon Go developer Niantic coming in. This is crazy. Uh, FTX and Qcoin, those are both cryptocurrency trading platforms, have raised $100 million and 50 million uh, sorry 150, 150 million for FTX and 100 million for Qcoin for a metaverse gaming fund and then Reddit co-founded to invest 100 million dollars in social media on Solana that's one of the coins FTX Lightspeed and Solana Ventures partner on a 100 million dollar web3 gaming fund so a lot of like you see a lot of things happening here in the gaming fronts like we've been talking about um just the, the list goes on and on and on. So this is not going anywhere. This is not going anywhere. These companies are pumping millions, if not billions of dollars into the cryptocurrency space. And then finally, MicroStrategy has purchased another $82 million in Bitcoin. That's Michael Saylor. He now holds 122,478 Bitcoins worth more than $5.9 billion dollars that is a billion with a b and he has gained more than 2.2 billion in gains since its initial purchase in august 2020 if you have ever watched a interview with uh michael saylor you know this guy is never selling i mean he's i believe him when he says that but he is not going to be selling his bitcoin so a true believer and he just keeps accumulating more and more of this stuff it is going to become less and less uh, available you see bitcoin circulating supply now 18.896 million coins so getting to that magic number of 21 million coins probably after i'm long gone from this planet but uh, this stuff is just going to be becoming increasingly more difficult to buy as more and more people come into the space so covered a lot this week i hope you found all of that interesting if you can hit that thumbs up for me i'd appreciate it. i hope everybody is looking forward to the christmas uh holidays maybe taking a break with your loved ones i know i'm going to be looking forward to the break um it's, it's been a you know like i said it's been a it's been a year an interesting year full of ups and downs you know everybody has their ups and downs in life i am no different i'm a human being so i'm looking forward to the break uh, it will be the first time that my uh, sisters and niece, nieces and mother and myself have been together in one place for a while. Because uh, we're all split up all over the place. So it's going to be an interesting Christmas. Looking forward to it. I hope you are getting time to spend with your family too. That's pretty cool. And then uh, Christmas is really a time for, for gratitude, right? We come together with our families, hopefully, wherever you are in the world, and just think about the past year and the things that we're grateful for. That's what I like to do. Hi, Patty from France. How are you? Bonjour. Uh, will Zopa return the defaulted losses? I don't know what they're going to do regarding that. You know? I don't know. I haven't logged into my account. I don't have very much in there, but I'm presuming those losses will probably, um, I mean, if they're technically in default, they'll continue to chase them. I would imagine whether you get the money back or not is, uh, will probably be ongoing. Yeah. You did lose money with them. That's unfortunate. Alan says they are buying the defaulted loans at face value, i.e. oh zero P and they will keep any future recoveries. That's not very cool. Mike says they as Oprah is buying any late loans at full value. Okay. Hi Stephen in uh Nottingham, how are you tonight? Alan says that uh, Crowd Property's average return of 8.3% is a lie. 
It's the mean of each year's return. So their first year return of 13% when they lent less than 3 million counts the same as this year, they've lent 68 million. Okay. I think that the, um, you know, the returns have been pretty good compared to some other peer to peer companies out there. John says about 15% of my cufflink loans have been extended. Not good news. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty standard within property investment lending. Uh, you see it even with companies like LoanPad, a lot of the loans get extended. Oh, well, yeah, one other thing. Uh, I believe LoanPad has recovered that one defaulted loan because I got an email from them find that email real quick but remember that one loan that's been on loan pads books for ever has Let's see 2021 has been a great year for loan pad we have increased the loan portfolio by over 150 percent giving investors a superb level of diversification they're looking to raise that number to 200 plus loans in the future so that way 0.5% of your funds will be invested in each loan. Good diversification. We are pleased to report that loan number 9922376 has been fully repaid along with all interest. We elected not to charge the default rate of interest on this loan. So the small increase in the interest coverage fund is due to simple compound interest on the fund that's used. So there you go. Um, Louis over at LoanPad finally having success in that one defaulted loan. Let me take a look and see if it shows on the live data, data feed. There you go. Number of ICF service loans back to zero. The internet, the uh, ICF interest coverage fund now at 42,315, so we've seen that reset. So bravo to LoanPad. Uh, that was, I mean, one loan in default finally taken care of, so uh, pretty cool. Close that out. Buffy and Charlie did a great YouTube interview on Bitcoin. I know they hate Bitcoin, both of them. They're 160 years old, so they wouldn't like it. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch the interview. Sorry, a bit like YouTube won't let me watch this live stream in restricted mode. I don't know what that means. What's restricted mode? Mark B, anyone here in lending crowd? It's taken me almost two years to get most of my money out. Still waiting on the rest of my loans selling off. Yeah, I got out of them a long time ago. I wasn't wasn't very happy with them. So I like the guy running it. Just think his name's Stuart. Seemed like a nice guy, but. Yeah, I wasn't big on the uh, investments that were coming through there. Had some definite default. I noticed a lot of unbolted loans are in the same items as the loan paid back. So I assume they're almost just rolling over a lot of the loans. Yeah, usually, I mean, that's pretty normal in the pawnbroking world. The loans just get recycled a lot. I know because my dad was in the jewelry business and um, I did see some of that pawnbroking going on and people just tend to recycle, they'll pay their interest and then some of those items just get held forever. You see gold items on jewelry, they're just so easy to liquidate that 
if you're getting paid back the interest it doesn't really matter it's not like it's a property loan car carful welcome assets exchange seems to be picking up in the last few days yeah i've had quite a lot of uh questions about assets exchange and i don't know if i posted the interview with pete peter reed on this channel whether it's on the other one but if you want to find the other financial ch thing channel it has an interview with assets exchange boss man uh, i like what he's doing over there you just don't have as much history as some of the other companies out there Could China drag China drag everything down? I mean, it's, it's obviously a, it's a concern. China is a behemoth in the financial world, but I think this Evergrande situation has just really been. Um, everybody knew that things were weird over there. There's a lot of unoccupied real estate buildings and apartments and things that I don't know how people were paying for it, but. Um, it could certainly have an effect, but I think it's probably a long, a, a short-term effect. I don't think it's necessarily going to have a long-term effect. You know, every, everything in the stock market seems to be short-term affected at the moment. Uh, does abundance have a minimum amount? I can't remember. I think they do have a minimum loan amount. I have to look it up. Brian said, I uh, said at the time Evergrande would have a huge impact on Alibaba. Yeah, you know, you'd think so, but today it hasn't really, it hasn't crashed the stock price. What are we down? 1%, 1.1% today. So maybe not of as bigger effect as you might think. Mark's in Barber, one of my regrets. Double down, hopefully write it out or take the hit. Yeah, Chinese stocks are just risky. There, there was, I, I was a little hesitant, and that's not the only uh, Barber that I own, by the way. I got more than what I have in that trading 212 account. But uh, I have a feeling that the stock price has a good chance of doubling if we can avoid the issues with what's going on in China, and the government will keep out of it. But that's one of the issues. Government doesn't seem to be able to stay out of the uh, stock market companies. By the way, don't forget, if you're not a member of the Discord, it's free. Um, if you look in the description below, you can sign up for the Discord, come chat freely. It's always been my goal to build a community of good financial thing people, so hopefully you will join up and come hang out with us and chat. Michael Saylor owns roughly 1% of all the Bitcoin in the world. That guy is committed. Yes, he is. Thank you, Annabelle. I hope to I hope to make it too. <laughs> yeah, so I'm flying in on December the 18th, and I heard they're coming out with new restrictions on the 20th. So I thought if I get in there before the 18th or before the 20th, I would. I thought that would be the the right thing to do. Australian computer scientist Craig Wright claimed to be an inventor of Bitcoin, won a legal case allowing him to retain 1.1 retain 1 .1 million Bitcoin. That's crazy. 
I have not heard about that. Now, now I have to look that up. There's a big belief out there too that there were many people that invented Bitcoin that was a group and not just one. very difficult to prove that he actually created it. Wow. So he got sued by his former business partner was due half. So he's got 54 billion US dollars, 50, 40 billion pounds of Bitcoin. That's crazy. So since 2016, Mr. Wright has claimed that he is Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin. I don't know. I don't know how you even prove that. It'd be very difficult to prove. Okay, I think that is going to do it. We've run over the one hour. Thank you to everybody for joining. Thank you again to Cufflink for sponsoring this channel on the show. And thanks to everybody for joining. Appreciate the fact that every single one of you comes and spends time here once a week. We'll be back next Thursday, all being well. Uh, God willing. And I hope you guys have a great week and a great weekend. And be safe out there, good health, stay dry, and join the Discord again. Um, see if I can post the link here for you. I know, let's see, financial, no, no. I will post the link so you have it. If you want to join the Discord, come join up. Come join and chat with us. I'm sure you have good stuff to share. This is something I just created recently. You can sign up for the Discord. I will put it in the chat. If I can spell it right. There you go. And we'll see you all next week. Have a great uh, rest of your week and a great weekend. Blessings. Take care. Bye.